video is designed to discuss the p-value approach to hypothesis testing. Um, I've written in the definition of a p-value first on the board, and we're going to discuss that to start out. So it says the probability of, an, of observing data that would produce a test statistic as extreme or even more extreme as the one observed, given HO is in fact true. So we're assuming HO is true, and we're wondering um, what's the probability that we would get a test set as extreme or even more extreme. Now I'll underline that phrase, so I want to show you what that means. So let's do a couple of drawings and look at that. If you're dealing with a traditional hypothesis test that involves X bar, let's say, and we have a bell curve assumption in the problem, so we're assuming that X bars are only distributed, um, we might plot our test stat on the curve. Let's say our test stat, test stat TS, I'll use your test stat, is here, right? Let's say that's where our test stat lands. Now, if I say the probability that the test stat is Again, remember your test stat is a Z test statistic in this type of a problem. And it says the probability that a test, stat, test statistic is as extreme or even more extreme. So when we mean by extreme, we mean in the extreme tails, right? Or for, as far away from the center, in other words. So what's the probability we would get a test stat this far from the center of the curve or even further, for example? That would be the idea. That would be under the scenario that we're dealing with a right tail test statistic, right? A right tail test, I should say. So that's essentially the idea, but we want to go over the different cases that can occur because not all hypothesis testing does the test stat fall on the right-hand side of the curve, and not all hypothesis tests are right-tailed hypothesis tests. So let's cover this topic by talking about the three different cases, right? So again, just to recap the logic, we're looking for the probability that if this was your test statistic from a particular um, hypothesis testing procedure, we're looking for the probability that we would get another test stat from another set of observed data that would be as far from zero or even further. That's the definition of p-value in this circumstance. Now, depending on the uh, type of hypothesis testing you're doing, because later on, if you take a stats 2 flash, you'll do different kinds of hypothesis testing. Um, you'll see that um, your test stat is not always C, and then sometimes this has to be changed a little bit depending on the specific test, but it's basically always that general idea. So um, you might say as large or even more large than the one you observed. You might say as small or even smaller than the one you observed, you know, so on and so forth. But I think this language is the most generic that allows you to apply it to as, as many cases as possible. So this definition of p-value I think is the best one. All right, so let's go on and, and look at the different cases. So now that we know the definition of a p-value, let's talk about the different scenarios. Well, there are going to be three unique situations where you have to calculate the p-value. Those three scenarios are related to the alternative hypothesis you have, because there are only three unique alternative hypotheses. And those hypotheses actually just tell us what kind of test we're conducting, whether it's left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed. So in other words, we might have an HA that says something like the mean is less than some number. Let's just use the number 10 just as a generic number, okay? So the mean is less than 10. Because the HA has a less than symbol, it's a left-tailed hypothesis test. And that means that when we do our hypothesis testing method, we're going to plot our test statistic on the curve wherever it lands. Let's say it lands here, our Z test stat. Let's say our Z test stat lands there on the curve. In order to calculate the p-value, we're going to find the area to the left of the test statistic, right? The area to the left of the test stat. So it's very easy to remember. A left tail test, or a left tail test, the p value equals the area to the left of your test stat. Okay, so that's it. That's the rule for a left tail test. I do want to caution you, though, that uh, the test stat, just because it's a left tail test, the test stat isn't always on the left-hand side, right? It doesn't have to be. So sometimes your test stat actually ends up on the right-hand side of the curve, which can occur, and if that does, you still have to follow the rule for calculating the p-value. So let's say I ended up with a test stat here. Let's say it ends up here. I still have to follow this rule for a left tail test, right? It's the area to the left of the test stat, so I actually have to calculate all of this area. So a lot of times, uh, my students, for example, when they run across this type of a problem, they'll find the area in the tail, and that's because they're so used to finding the tail area when calculating the p-value. But you have to follow the rule. You can't just always find 
assign the tail area. If it's a left tail test, you assign the area to the left of the test stat. That's the rule, so you have to adhere to that always. Okay, let's look at another case then, another scenario. Let's look at the scenario where you have a greater than symbol in HA. What if it said the mean is greater than 10, if that was your hypothesis? Well, the greater than indicates it's a right tail test, so when you do your drawing, you know, you might end up with a test statistic on the right-hand side of the curve or on the left, but it doesn't really matter. The rule is going to be this. So this is going to be for a right tail test. A right tail test, the p-value is the area to the, you can guess, I'm sure that it's going to say to the right of the test statistic. Right, so if my test stat lands here, for example, this is where it lands on the Z number line, if it lands here, the rule is I have to find the area from that point and over to the right. And that would be the P value for the test, right? That area is going to be called the P value. However, again, the test stat, just because it's a right tail test, doesn't always have to be on the right hand side. If it was here, remember you would find the area all the way to the right. Okay, and there's only one other scenario. The only other symbol you can have in HA is a not equal to symbol. I say it's not equal to 10, right? Not equal to 10. So I'm saying basically it's either bigger or smaller than 10. That's the null, null hypothesis. So this is for the two-tailed scenario. For the two-tailed test, the p-value equals, this one's a little bit different. You're just going to say the p-value is twice the tail area beyond the test stat. Beyond the test stat. So twice the area beyond the test stat. Okay, so in other words, if I had a test statistic on the, say, right-hand side of the curve, if that's where my test stat was, then I would find this area, the tail area. The tail area is always a little skinny tail at the end of the curve. Since we're on the right-hand side, that's the right tail. And then we would do twice that. So that's how we handle it. We do twice whatever that turns out to be. If that turns out to be 2%, our p-value is 4%, then, right? Of course, if your test stat had landed on the other side of the curve, right? and your test stat landed over here, you would find the area in the leftmost tail, and you would do twice that area. So those are the rules or basic ideas. To understand why it's twice the area is because, if you remember the definition of a p-value, is the probability that we would have a test stat, right? A test stat this extreme, in other words, this far from the center, or even further, right? But if it's a two-tailed test, it's possible that you could be this far and further on both sides of the curve. This is a two-tailed test. This is arguing what? That it's either below this number or above that number. So either one suffices. Okay, good. So we know the rule on how to find the p-value. There's only three cases. We can memorize those cases and do that successfully, I think, every time. Um, in the example problems, we show how to find those areas. It's actually pretty easy. It's something you would have done earlier on in your course. So that's not really the difficult part of p-value. So we know how to find it. That's simple. From here, what I want to do is to see how that fits into our original seven steps of hypothesis testing that we learned. So if you remember, we had first step, identify the claim, second step, determine HOHA, third step, get the data, fourth step, calculate the test statistic. Nothing changes up to this point. It's all the same. The only thing that changes is these two steps here, five and six. They change a little bit. The critical value is no longer used. You're going to cross that critical value out, and you're going to find the P value instead. So that's the big difference. You're going to find the p-value in step five instead of finding your critical value. And we just talked about how to find the p-value there. Once you have that p-value, then in step six, you're going to form your initial conclusion a little bit different. How you're going to do that is actually really simple. You're going to use this simple rule which says this. If p, if your p-value, in other words, so I'll call it p, is less than alpha, which is your significance value, you're going to reject H O. Remember, we're always testing H O, so we'll reject H O in this scenario. If P is greater than alpha, you do not reject. Do not reject H O. In 
And of course you say, well, there's another case. What if P is actually equal to alpha? Well, first of all, it shouldn't happen very often because in theory these are both continuous numbers. Granted, this one's chosen, so but it can be chosen from a continuous list of numbers. Um, this P value, of course, is going to be a probability, and again, it should be a continuous uh, number, random variable, essentially. And that means that we have a pretty small probability of them being exactly the same. Theoretically, we'd have zero chance of them being exactly the same. However, in practice, because of rounding and other issues, um, we often um, might encounter p-values that are basically the same as alpha. When that happens, it's really up to the researcher. We would call it a marginal case. You can decide whether that's strong enough evidence to reject HO or not. You can kind of go either way in that circumstance. So either way, though, these are your rules, and that's how you form your initial conclusion. And everything else really is the same from there. If you reject HO, of course, you support HA. If you do not reject HO, you do not reject not support HA, pardon me, and then you can go word your final conclusion based on how we did that in the problem videos. All right, so last thing I want to say about the p-value approach is just try to remember this rule that it's the small p, the small probability, right? A small probability means that there's something unusual happening, and if that's the case, we're going to reject the null hypothesis, right? So that's the idea. Okay, so small p, reject HO. Just remember that, and you should be okay.